Adam Duggins, welcome to Acquiring Minds. Great to be here, Will. I'm excited to be here. Adam, I was connected to you by Jacob Lee, a previous guest. Jacob was a student at Darden, UVA's business school, and was first exposed to buying businesses by a guest lecturer in one of his Darden classes. That guest lecturer was none other than you, and it really made an impression on him. He, after school, he went off to work in consulting, but you had planted a seed in his mind about buying a business that he would later return to. So today you'll be talking to an audience a bit bigger than a classroom, and not just about buying a business, but about building a Holdco. You're about 10 years into building your Holdco, New Page Capital, which is a Holdco regionally focused in North Carolina's triad. So let's get into it, Adam. Start us off with a little background on you, please. Um, well, first, thanks for having me, Will. This is uh, always fun to, to, to share our story and, and share what we've, we've been able to do. Um, so I'm a, I'm a North Carolina native, uh, Greensboro, uh, North Carolina, which, you know, for most folks might be the occasional home of the ACC tournament. Um, it, it was a, it was a great place to grow up, a uh, great place to be raised, uh, but wasn't something that, uh, is a place that I necessarily sought to come back to. Uh, I played basketball. You can't tell this on, uh, on the camera, but I'm 6'10". So I played basketball at uh, at William and Mary uh, up in Virginia, uh, and uh, so had the height and, and got to use it and got a free education out of it, which wasn't a, wasn't a bad deal. And then um, <laughs> and then after William and Mary went to uh, went to what was at the time called MCI Worldcom, uh, which was a, a, a pretty prominent telecom company in the uh, early two thousands uh, that declared bankruptcy a week after I got my job offer. Um, you know, was a fascinating time, worked there for three years in corporate finance. There was a lot of fraud that had happened prior to me being there. I was not part of the fraud. I was part <laughs> of uh, part of the team that was kind of tasked with uncovering it. Um, and so was there for three years, great experience, and then went back to UVA uh, to, uh, to Darden, to, to, to the business school. Um, didn't really know what I wanted to do, uh, which is why consulting was a perfect kind of segue for me because if you don't know what you want to do consulting is a is a great fit and uh and, and so chose the consulting route out of uh out of darden um but a lot of seeds were planted there in terms of you know ultimately what what i ended up doing and, and even seeds i don't think i actually realized were being planted um went to bain and company down in atlanta Worked predominantly, uh, worked in, uh, so that's consulting, but worked predominantly in the private equity group. So uh, uh, for the, that can be a little bit uh, convoluted, but um, so you know, our clients were all the private equity firms uh, that uh, that you hear about, and you know, it's been a lot of my weeks in the Northeast and and Northern California, uh, advising you know private equity clients on different deals. Um, yeah, it was an incredible experience, um, a very demanding. Uh, demanding experience, um, but for me, I started uh, at, when I started at Bain. We had our uh, m- my wife and I. We had our oldest son, and then had twins fifteen months later. Um, and so, having more control over over my life and kind of what I was going to do was starting to become more prominent of where we wanted to live and um, and what we wanted to do. And so. Got an opportunity to go take a kind of a uh, what I like a VP of operations role at a healthcare services business up in the Triangle, not to be confused with the Triad, uh, just north of Durham, uh, and did that for about a year, and then uh, and then started New Page, and so that's that's my that's my kind of quick story of how I ultimately got to uh, to, to starting New Page. And then I wanted to ask, there was also about how you ended up in Greensboro specifically. Yeah. There was a conversation with your, with your wife where it, was, it still qu- wasn't quite on your radar as a place to settle down. Tell us about that. Yeah, it's interesting. When we got engaged, we, you know, we have all those big life decisions and life conversations. How many kids do you want to have? Um, you know, wh- you know how do you, where do you want to live? And one of the agreements that we made was... We would never live in each other's hometown, and um, <laughs> not because of not because we didn't have great upbringings and didn't love our families, just wanted to, to a balance of power thing. Uh, that's right, that's right. <laughs> and so I, I remember thinking we would probably end up in Raleigh or Richmond, which was kind of you know kind of a middle point between where our families were and areas that we we knew pretty well. And we were visiting Greensboro 
uh, one time. Mm -hmm. And uh, and my wife kind of said to me, you know, like Greensboro would be a pretty good place to raise a family. And I was like, it wasn't even on my radar. You know, we had we had kind of said we weren't gonna weren't gonna end up being here. Um, and also, what had happened was as we st as I started to think about doing a search, you know, I talked to people who were doing this in Richmond, and I talked to people who were doing it in Raleigh, and there were a, there were a, a good amount. You know, there were probably five to ten individuals in each of those uh, metros doing it, so it, it was going to be competitive. And um, but I couldn't find anyone in the triad. Um, now that's for some good reason, some not so good reason. The the reason why is is this area has had a bit of a talent drain to the two larger metropolitan areas in, in Raleigh and Charlotte. Um, so a lot of the young talent is drawn towards those those metro areas, but there's still a lot of good legacy businesses here. And and mm -hmm. so for for the search, I started to think, well, maybe while everybody's going in this direction, maybe I'll go in a different direction. Um, and then when my wife, Laura, said, hey, I think it would be great to raise our family in Greensboro, that was, you know, seemed like the start of the line. And, and we decided to decided to quit my job and, and, and move here and I don't know, kind of on a whim. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, at least she she um, broke the agreement in your favor. And that's right. That's and right. <laughs> if, if it had been <laughs> the opposite, it might have been a little <laughs> little trickier. Yeah. Now, what year is this? This is uh, this would be uh, 2013. So I just got to call out. So if 2013, so a long time ago in search years, um, as we often a theme that, you know, it's gotten m more competitive and a hot thing in the last kind of five, seven years, 2013, 10 years ago, even before that. Um, and you already you felt like five to 10 other searchers in Richmond and Raleigh, medium sized cities was a lot. You know, I suspect there's that much more today so you're probably oh, yeah. scaring a little scaring people a little bit who are, yeah. who are in medium-sized markets because there's probably 20 or 25 in in those cities today yeah i think that's right i mean it was um richmond would get the benefit of dc you'd get people who lived in dc who yeah. wanted to come down um and then you know raleigh's obviously got tremendous uh universities around it uh you know, and I say searchers, it, it was a little different back then, you know, like searching might be, might constitute searching while I still have a job. Uh, and, and I thought that was, I feel like that was a little more common, um, back then. It was interesting. I don't know. I don't remember what I called what I was doing early on. Um, but like a search fund, it, you know, cause we didn't, we didn't have a fund. So but like searching was kind of what we, the terminology we used, but it was ultimately, I was like, I just wanted to find a business to buy. Yeah. Um, you know, coming out of a school like UVA and Darden, I could only find, you know, a handful of grads who had done anything remotely close to this. Um, and that has changed dramatically the last 10 mm -hmm. years. Um, the, the most people we knew I, I knew of doing this were from some of the you know more you know kind of what I'd call prominent schools of a Harvard or Stanford and some guys who I'd known at Bain you know one or two had, had gone down this path but it was not very well defined uh, mm -hmm. at all at that point so how did it occur to you I, I know from our yeah. pre-call that your exposure to private equity is part of that answer yeah it is so when I was in Atlanta um, I would I would be on these cases up in in the Northeast, and I'd there were three things that stood out. Um, one, private equity firms would only look at uh, opportunities with an EBITDA above a certain threshold. At that time, it was like five million. Uh, even the smaller funds, you know, maybe they'd creep down to three or four million in EBITDA. But I kept thinking, gosh, what about a business that does a million in EBITDA? Like that's a that's a good solid business. And there, there just wasn't a lot of attention being paid. Um, the other thing was, I can't tell you, this probably happened. I bet this happened more than a handful of times. We'd be working hard on a case. And then some partner would go, well, how are we going to replace that 65-year-old owner founder who started the business? And no one would have a good answer. And so this idea of secession planning really started to just kind of, I mean, I saw, I saw small deals and big deals get really de derailed because they didn't have a good plan uh, for the, for the succession planning. And then 
you know, I, I distinctly remember being in New York with with a, a private equity client and uh, the, the the biz dev guy, the guy who's out looking for the deals was talking to me and he, he said, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm going down to North Carolina. And I kind of perked up and I'm like, I'm from there. Where, where are you going? And he's like, I'm flying into Raleigh and uh, looking at some deals there. And then I'm driving over to Charlotte. And I'm like, man, you're driving through my hometown. Are you looking at anything in the triad? And he said, you know, kind of really quickly, he's like, yeah. He's like, oh, we don't, we don't really think there's a lot there, and it's kind of hard to get to. And, and I mean, we we have six or seven flights to Laguardia every day, but the perception is that it's a little bit outside of a primary market, and uh, and it kind of just. It, it, it happened, and at the time, I was like, "That's weird. Why would he? Why would he think that?" But I think, like, oftentimes, deals do get kind of swayed by, you know, if they're in a certain market or in a certain. And I get it, right? You you, you want to be able to attract young talent. You want any company you buy to to be in a in a in a hot area. Um, but you know, there's there's you know, one and a half million people that live in the triad. This it's not a small place. Um, and so for me, it kind of said a lot of, of like, well, I'm not sure. Maybe they're not looking there. And mm-hmm. um, that happened probably 18 months before I ultimately made the jump. But it, it planted that seed of no one's looking. No one's looking here. And, um, and, and that's, that's kind of how that all transpired from uh, those private equity guys. And going back to your point about the succession planning and how you saw deals die because they didn't have a good answer for who would operate it. Was your thought that um, your answer to finding such an opportunity would be that you'd be the operator or that you'd be able to hire an operator better than they were able to? At, at that point, it was that I would be the operator. So I was, you know, we're talking, I was probably 30, 31, 32 at this point. Um, and, and it struck me that a lot of the deals, you know, would, would, would get derailed because of that. And so the idea was, well, what if, you know, could I step in and be that person uh, to be that successor for the the the, the prior owner? Um, because it, it, you know, it, it, you can't ever replace an, an original founder owner. You can't. Uh, it, you know, and I think I think it's a fool's you know fool's errand to try to replace that person. Um, but I do think you can you can uh, you can backfill that person in a way that maybe is different and. Uh, and so that was the original idea. The original idea was definitely that I would be the one stepping in as I was starting to think about what, and I didn't even, call, it wasn't called New Page then. It was just an idea of like, could I buy a business? Could I be that person who takes over a business um, and, uh, and and go from there? And you had the confidence that you you could be the answer, even though you didn't have operational experience. Yes, you had corporate experience and consulting experience, but a lot of people in you know SMB operator land, which you now probably know, yeah. uh, kind of look derisively at the consultants, and uh, you know it's like these these folks, their you know their knowledge of business is very abstract. You know, dealing with the hungover, you know employees or whatever, you know, all the, the, the myriad headaches that, that small business really means is not something they're necessarily equipped to do, but you felt I, confident that you could. I was incredibly naive. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, the one thing that Bain taught me was we would have these short duration cases of three to four weeks and you know, the client would come or the partner would come to our team and say, Hey, I need us to solve this problem or size this market and you would sometimes get these problems and you're like this is impossible to do in three weeks like i can there's no way we can do this and time and time again you figured it out and and so i think that gave me great confidence in that i could through hard work and and through just kind of persistence i could figure things out now i will tell you leaving bain i was not ready Working in that VP of Ops role for that year really grounded me in a in a meaningful way, and I'm very thankful I did that for a year before I started uh, started doing this because um, because it is different, right? You're 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 going from managing very very motivated individuals who, um, in some ways, you have to almost rein in some of the hard work because they're 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 willing to do whatever, work whatever hours to uh to 
I, I'm not going to say less motivated, differently motivated people, um, because you know a a a Bain consultant versus an hourly um, sheet metal mechanic. Um, they're both very motivated. They're just differently motivated. And I think for me as a manager, as a, as a leader, I had to learn the different levers that I wanted to pull and the type of leader I wanted to be um, with all types. And and so that year of kind of post Bain before I started this was kind of instrumental in, in me kind of testing that out a little bit and, and figuring out what that was going to feel like. And, and remind me what that business was and how how many employees did it have? Yeah, it so it was a business called Care Services. Still, 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 still exists. Uh, it's a, a pharmacy benefit management company, a lo- long term pharmacy pharmacy benefit management company. So PBM uh, had what we we were essentially doing a merger integration of three different companies and kind of pulling them together. Uh, so the total company had about a hundred employees, mostly hourly. Um, a lot of uh, you know call center administration type work. Um, so you know, not pure blue collar, not using your hands more at a computer and, and whatnot, but still, um, you know, still definitely in, at an hourly workforce. Um, and uh, and you know, I think that that was you know, like a like I said, a, just a great experience to make sure that it was grounding, right? Because I. When I say I was in the Triangle, I was actually in a small town called Oxford, North Carolina, which is about 40 minutes north of Durham. Um, and and you just experience different things than being in, you know, Buckhead in Atlanta and the and the shiniest office. And then you go to this place. Um, and and I think for me, uh, it made me realize I really liked the 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 quote unquote hourly worker, the more blue collar worker. I actually enjoyed working with them more. Um, really? Because yeah, because to me it was they had better perspective um, on life <laughs> in, in general, and and you know it's interesting. Before this, before I got on with you today, I was down at our steel plant, and I I love nothing more than walking out into the plant and just talking to the guys and hearing what's going on with them, hearing their concerns, hearing what they're what, what's happening because. Um, you know, it, 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 the, the, the perspective they have is I'm putting in the hard work, I'm doing this and that, but they have, you know, you know, strains in their life as well. And, and for me, that's always very grounding to make sure that I've got the right perspective of why am I doing this? Why are we doing this? Um, who are we taking care of? Um, who are we giving opportunities to? And, uh, and, you know, I love, I love, kind of going down there. I mean, I, that, that's my happy place. Uh, truly wow. when I, when I, when I get out there on the, on the, on the plant floor. That's, that's so interesting and, um, kind of hopeful when you say that kind of blue fo- collar folks have a little bit better perspective than shiny people. Uh, is it yeah. just, they're just sh- shiny people. <laughs> I'll just go with that phrase. Shiny yeah. people can be, um, just over, focused on their on work essentially is it kind of distilled to that or is it to elaborate please yeah yeah yeah. i think that i love the shiny people that's a good way to put it <laughs> I, I think the shiny people sometimes get so engulfed in their own ambition of what their career is what promotion they're going to get um they get very self-focused mm. um and i i've just been amazed by the folks in our workforce they're they're focused on themselves and their families, but they're also worried about other families too. And and it's more familial, it's more community, um, and and I think that to me is is just the perspective that I I love. And um, and it's not to say that there's not good shiny people. There are, um, yeah. And 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 they are. But I think sometimes when you're sitting in a really fancy office in a financial district. You know, when you're working in New York or Boston or San Francisco, it's hard to have perspective on what 97 percent of this country is actually like, which is, um, you know, there's still I, I know more people live in cities than 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 uh, uh, than not in, in, in this uh, country. But there's still a lot of people who live in rural areas and mm-hmm. um, and they're real people and they're and they're good people. And, and so. Uh, I, I've just, I've really kind of found myself drawn 
drawn more towards uh, more towards those individuals. Well, that's um, that's really this is a really great conversation. Uh, I, I probably am going to want to circle back, um, particularly on how how you learn to motivate people who are who are differently motivated than than the shiny types. But let's let's uh, come back to it. So we haven't even gotten into. So you're in. You and your wife decide that in fact you will go. You will settle in your hometown. You've kind of ha- had this insight uh, working close to private equity that maybe you know there's all these there's all these opportunities that private equity isn't looking at or isn't executing on for one reason or another, and you feel like you could. What th- then? What? Yeah. So I, I, you know, I have a conversation with my wife, and I say, "Hey, I want to search for a business." Um, and we had already kind of landed on, we wanted to be in the triad, but we were still kind of trying to figure out what it is. And I said, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to quit my job and I'm just going to look full time. And, you know, this is one of those moments, even now I get, I get kind of chills thinking about this moment because it was a scary moment for me. Uh, I was really putting it on the line and, and, uh, my wife's a processor. And so she kind of sat there and, and thought about it for all of about 10 seconds (laughs) <laughs> and then she said, hey, how do you make money looking for a business full time? And I said, you don't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but we've saved. We've saved. We had saved. And I said, we've got some savings. We'll live off of that, you know, for a certain amount of time. And she kind of kind of paused and thought about it. And then she's like, all right, I'm in. And it was one of those moments <laughs> for me where. You know, I think about my gosh, I chose the right partner in life, mm-hmm. and and mm-hmm. and I chose someone who has total trust in me, um, and what a what an incredible gift that is. So, mm-hmm. um, so we we were kind of you know we made that decision probably in May. I think I announced my resignation a couple months later. Started to lay the groundwork. I, you know, I remember the little things that people were telling me I needed to do, like you need to have a website. You need to have uh, uh, business cards, you know, which was and it's see, you need to have an email address, right? And it's like these little things that in my life, someone had always done those things for me. So it was it was kind of a whole fun learning process of like, okay, I gotta I gotta build a website, you know, uh, I gotta who do I get business cards from? You know, what do I get an email address? I gotta get a you know all this all these things that you don't think about and. So we move on Labor Day of 13 and I just start looking and and I was probably pretty unstructured at first um, and realized I needed to kind of, you know, kind of really frame what I was doing. Now, now our, our, our kind of thesis or my thesis at that time was instead of because I was so geographically specific, I couldn't. I couldn't narrow what I wanted and what I didn't want. I needed to look at anything. And, um, and, and, and so, you know, the idea was I, I wasn't out there raising money. So people were willing to talk to me. You know, when you're raising money, people are always a little bit more hesitant, but I wasn't. And, and, and all I was trying to do was trying to find businesses and uh, started to network. And I, and I kind of felt like within an area that's, you know, call it a, a million, million and a half people in the triad, there were probably 1,500 to 2,000 people that really mattered for my search. Um, and those were, you know, attorneys, accountants, insurance agents, uh, any sort of business aggregators of relationships. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I started just networking, uh, you know, pretty, and I, I was fortunate. I had uh, a couple people who helped me kind of get there. A lot of people thought, oh, you're from here it'll be easy for you to network in. But I hadn't lived in Greensboro in 15 years. Yeah. I had no professional network at all. Yeah. And uh, and so it helped a little bit. Uh, sometimes I'm not sure it helped. You know? you know, sometimes it was like, oh, you're from here. Did something happen? Is something wrong? Like, you know, why are you, why are you doing this? And so, um, it, you know, and it, it's interesting when you just, des- when I described what I was doing, some people got it. Some people didn't, and I don't think cared to. And some people just thought I was crazy, um, you know, I, including probably my parents. Um, I'm not sure they knew. They really could understand what it was I was trying to do. Um, 
you know, I remember uh, distinctly a recruiter who I had worked with in a prior role about three or four years after I, I started New Page. He kind of pulled me aside and he said, hey, man, I, I need to admit something to you. Um, when you left your job and started doing this search thing, I thought you had lost your mind. And I thought you were going to fail miserably. And I, I almost said something to you, but I didn't know what to say. And, uh, and he said, but now I get what you were trying to do. And I was like, I was like, and I really appreciated him saying that it, it t- took a lot for him to say that he, he was, he was wrong. Not that he was wrong, but he was just, you know, he, he was confused. And so that first couple months was, was a lot about me getting my pitch down a lot about figuring out how do I tell my story in 30 seconds? How do I tell my story in five minutes and 10 minutes and 15 minutes and buying a lot of lunches. And, uh, I mean, one of, uh, one of my investors told me early on, they said, buy lunch every single time. And I, and I, I, you know, and that was kind of painful, you know, I mean, I was, I, I was, I had no income. And so I'm like, Oh gosh, this lunch, I guess I'll pick it up. I'll pick it up. And people will always let you buy their lunch. You know, most of the time <laughs> you go to grab the bill, they're like, okay, fine, free lunch. Um, <laughs> but I think it was a really effective way to get someone to uh, buy in a little more. It, it was little things like that. Um, and and I remember I was the one asking them for something, so I should buy the lunch. And so that's, that's like a small tidbit that probably cost, I don't know, I probably spent – 15 grand in lunches that first year. And that was the best money I probably ever could spend because I got, you know, from, from my standpoint, I got a lot of folks, um, you know, who wanted to help. Um, 15 grand. I bet I did. I mean, I, I'm telling wait, wait, you. So let's say, let's, let's just be super conservative and say each lunch was a hundred dollars. It wasn't a hundred dollars. So it was 10 it wasn't times. A, it was even less. Right. So, yeah. so, so, so wait, what's my math? 10 times 15. 150 lunches, but probably more like 200, 250. Oh, I had a lot. I mean, if, if every single, so I met with, I tracked this, I met with 650 people the first year. Wow. And so I <laughs> wow. was, I was, I mean, in, in my, cause my ask in every meeting was connect me to three to five people who you know who I, who I might be able to connect with. And I would take meetings that, it, what was interesting is sometimes you would take a meeting that you would think I'm not going to get anything from it. And those were sometimes the best connections. And then other times you would take a meeting of a really well-connected individual who was known in the community and nothing would come from it because oftentimes they don't have the time to help you. Uh, you know, I, I found the perfect mix of person was uh, someone who was a, maybe a little less known in the community, a little less demands on their time who really wanted to help. Um, but yeah, I mean, and I say, you know, it was it was it was breakfast. It was it was coffee, um, and I would try to have, you know, I would try to hit sixty meetings a month. It was was my goal, and every month I would try to have sixty meetings um, in person. Each in, per, each one in, in person. person in person. Yeah. Wow, Adam, and, and, that and, is and, impressive. Well, and I think I think that also speaks to this area. Um, I think if I had been doing it in Atlanta. I don't think you can do that many in person. One, just because Atlanta is more spread out, but also, I think people are maybe a little in a in a bigger city, a little busier. They're going to be a little less willing to grab a lunch with someone. But in yeah. a smaller community uh, like Greensboro or like Winston Salem or High Point, um, people are open to that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it was. I mean, I, I think the most. I think I had seven in one day. And I remember thinking like that was too much. Like I was like, I, 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 I'm kind of bleary uh, in terms of what I was saying. Um, but it was interesting. It was also the first time um, my, my, my eventual business partner told me this at the time. He said, I said, I don't have any sales experience. And he goes, well, what do you think you've been doing for the, you know, yeah. the entire search? And it was, it was invigorating. It was scary. Um, you know, uh, there were all sorts of bumps along the way, but, but yeah, it was a lot of meetings that first year. Um, I was everywhere. Well, you must've had, you know, baristas and waitresses who knew you by name and knew exactly, you know, how you liked your coffee. I mean, well, it's funny. I I don't drink coffee. So, so (laughs) I, I, so I don't, I don't drink coffee, uh, you know, and it's like just something I've never done. 
but you you kind of sometimes you're like okay i gotta figure out what i'm gonna drink i I can't just have this person get a coffee and me sit here you know drinking a water um there's a panera near near uh near where we live and i i would live there i mean i would just every meeting because i didn't have an office or anything like that and so uh that was uh that was a lot of fun a lot of fun that year well and and when you you're there so often coupled with your height I mean, they, they, yes. you know, they, the staff was all, there's the tall yes. guy again. Yeah, our yeah. it's like, oh, he's, he's still here. <laughs> you yeah. know, he's still still here <laughs> drinking his one drink. You know, I probably got a lot, like an iced tea or something, and I drank an iced tea all day or something like that. So. <laughs> well, um, so on, on this theme of how things have changed a lot in these last 10 years, of course, what you were doing, we, we call proprietary search today, um, yep. not using, you know, the websites are brokered. Um, brokered listings. And typically, uh, people are going to be doing blanket emails, bl- email blasts. Uh, that would be the 2013 version of what you did. Um, yep. Do you have any um, contrasting the two? Do you have any thoughts on that? Like, do would you like if you if you were to do today what you did, if you were confronted with doing today, arriving in Greensboro, and and um, drumming up a deal flow? Would you do it the same way again? Or would you use the technology tools? I would not use the technology tools, and, and I'll tell you why. Um, I'm now on the other end of this, where I mm. get those hits from the technology tools, and I get hit a lot. And and that was often, I mean, I, I, the hit rate on those is always low, right? But my hit rate on being able to, like, if I found a business, for the most part, I could figure out one or two ways, like one or two connections. It's kind of like, you know, the the... I'm going to date myself a little bit here, but six degrees of Kevin Bacon, you know, you can always mm-hmm. connect to Kevin Bacon and, and, mm-hmm. and, and it's a little bit like that in a community like this, where I was always probably to at the most three connections away from any given business and a warm lead in from an introduction to me is infinitely better than an email. Um, yeah. And we tried the email. I did a little bit of that. And and occasionally was successful in getting in and talking to the business, but there was a lack of trust there initially, and it was just always hard to overcome. As opposed to so and so's accountant, you know, introduces me into the business. That person trusts trust that accountant and trusts that I'm you know they're not waste I'm not wasting their time. And so I think I would do it similarly. I think a geographically uh, when you do a geographic search like like we did, like I did. That first year, um, even today, I think you can still network kind of the old fashioned way of networking your way in um, to to you know most businesses. I mean, I talk to a, a lot of folks who are doing this now, and even in larger markets, I still think that's an that's a more effective way um, because uh, you know you have to think about who you're targeting. You're targeting fifty five to seven year old, seven eighty year olds, um, where and this is less so now, but it's still true, where email is not their kind of primary form of communication. They still like to shake hands. They still like to get together. They want to put a face to a name. Um, And ultimately, that's the most important uh, person you're targeting is that eventual business owner that you're trying to convince to to, uh, sell their business to. So that they'll sell their business to you. The... 650, I mean, you, you you didn't know it at the time, as we said at the top, like you didn't set out to build a hold co, but those 650 meetings also had the added benefit that it just sets you up very nicely to what would what we now know what comes over these intervening 10 years. What is absolutely wild is all four businesses that we've eventually bought, I uncovered in that first year, all four, and some even very early on, like uh, the most recent acquisition we did was one of the first deals we had heard of. Um, and you're right. It built this network. Now, unfortunately for us, we've been distracted by buying businesses. So that I, you know, I don't always cultivate that network as well as I should, but yeah, mm. it, it planted a lot of seeds and some of those seeds, you know, bared fruit in the first year. Some took 10 years or, you know, to, to bear fruit, but eventually they did. I want to. I, I still want to dwell on this for a second. The 650. Were you? You. You had said you were 
at least initially meeting with the people who would give you access to the owners, the yeah. the, the attorneys and the and the the accountants and so on. Uh, the, of those six hundred and fifty, how many were actual were actually with business owners? Uh, so we looked at in that first year probably 150, 160 different deals. I may not have met with all those owners, but I probably got introduced or or, or, or spoke with them. And I think the, the, the learning I had early on also was um, my time was not that valuable. <laughs> yeah. Um, from the standpoint Although of I, you didn't say I'm sure you didn't say that to your wife at the time. I didn't say that to my <laughs> wife, but clock is ticking, waiting for that's you to right, bring, that's bring right. in, She's bring like, let's go, <laughs> let's go. Um, but um, my time wasn't so valuable. I would meet with anyone, anyone, and and you know, it was anybody in the business community. I'm just going to meet with them because if I've learned anything, it's like you just never know what connection is going to get you. To that spot, to that spot, right? And you know, and, and actually, it was something that um, my wife and I talked about because she was new to this community. She was meeting people too. She didn't, you know, it was it was a little awkward for her to say what her husband was doing because, you know, it was it was like, wait, your husband is un- is he unemployed? No, well, he's not really unemployed. He's he's look, he's searching for, so he's. Getting paid? No, he's not really getting paid. So he's unemployed. Yeah, you know, and mm-hmm. um, and she got very good at knowing how to convey that story too, um, to to others, and 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 you know, because there's people she would meet that she, you know, that they might be connected to someone, um, uh, or they might be someone uh, that we would want to talk to. So uh, it was, uh, yeah, you know, and I, I I reflect back on that year, um. This is a wild, kind of wild part of it. People often ask, like, what was I incredibly stressed about money? Was I incredibly stressed about, you know, finding something? It's actually the least I wor- I've probably worried about money in my entire adult life. And the reason being is I just stopped looking at what was happening to our savings because it was so, it was kind of depressing. So I just stopped looking and I was like, I know it's going down. I don't need to look at it. And, I, and I'm and i one of these people, I, I look at that stuff and I just stopped looking. And I was like, you know what? I'm putting my head down. I'm going to find something and this is going to be fine. And, and I think that I talk about having a, being a little bit delusional in, in, in what you have to do. You have to have a little bit of that. And, and I did. I, I had and probably still do a little bit, but um, just being delusional of, hey, I, I know like there's people who say this isn't going to work. I know this isn't going to work. I'm going to make this work um, because I you know, because I have to because I you know and I had a, a young family. My wife got pregnant during that first year, which made so with our fourth. So th- the numbers were not getting e- any easier for us to manage, <laughs> um, and so it was it was uh, it was a challenging uh, challenging time, but. But gosh, you know, I, I look back on it now and I look back on it with a smile. It was an incredible, incredible time. And, um, and I think I had fun with it. And, and I think that's hard. I was going to say, you're, you're smiling and you're clearly, yeah, you reflect back on it with some nostalgia. But in the moment where you, you, you I guess, I guess you kind of just answered that you, at, when you were watching your, your savings tick down, that stressed you out. You stopped doing that. Were you... I mean, what were you, did you have anxiety? Uh, I'm sure you had some, but I mean, were, like, what was your, what was your mood during these, this year? Uh, that year? For the, I think per, you know, 90% of the time it was very hopeful. It was, it was very, mm-hmm. uh, it, it, it was very, things are going to be okay. It was optimistic. Um, about every 10 meetings, I would have a bad meeting actually, you know, one where, and what do I define as a bad meeting? I define a bad meeting as someone who's, not only are they not going to help you, but they're going to they're going to tell you how you're going to fail. Um, and uh, I remember a couple of those where someone almost went out of their way to to kind of really want to um, point out that you're going to fail. And part of hmm. that came from I met a lot of individuals who were ten to fifteen years older than me that said, "Oh yeah, I was going to do that, or I'm going to do that," and they would claim that they had been looking you know, while having a full-time job, but then they would, they would, they would want to kind of 
knock you down. And yeah. there were a couple of those calls that were pretty tough to take. You know, a couple of those meetings where you, you got out and you're like, oh my gosh, is, 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 that, is that person right? Like, did I make a horrible choice? Mm -hmm. And for me, I would, I would let that feeling sink in for about 30 seconds. And I would say, you know, I'd, I'd kind of get down a, a little bit. And then I would say, you know what? F that. Like, no. Like, that guy's not going to tell me I can't make this work. I'm going to make it work. And in some ways, that motivated me even more. Like, those meetings were actually it, – it, it's funny. My, uh, uh, my business partner would, would laugh after I would have them because he would see I would get more fired up um, after those to, uh, to, to, to make this work. And so – um yeah you had a little gr chip chips on chips on shoulders i love a good chip on the shoulder i love a good chip on the shoulder and that, that goes back to my playing days i i just i love someone telling me i can't do something yeah because it, it's gonna it's a, a good motivator and and do you really think that these haters were people who were behaving that way to validate their own lack of executing yeah. on this plan mm -hmm. I, I think it was a little bit of that and i think it was also a hint of Maybe a hint of jealousy yeah. of gosh, I wish I had, I wish I had, you yeah. know, tried to do yeah. this. But also, also, I think there were some people who genuinely were like, "No, you're going to fail." Like, I, I think there were a couple who were who were trying to be like, "Hey, you've made a mistake. <laughs> like, don't do this." Yeah. Um, and and trying to be genuinely helpful, but um, but for me, it was you know, it was a, it, it was I had to I had to keep going I had to had to keep going I didn't have a choice at that point. Well, you probably had failed to tell those people that you were meeting, having two and you know three meet and seven meetings a day, and that That's they were right. they were That's in right. the presence of somebody who was going to go on to have six hundred and fifty meetings in a single year. So yeah. uh, that that makes you kind of a cut above. Well, we are uh, forty five minutes in, and we haven't even gotten to acquisition number one. So we are not going. Obviously, we're not going to have time to spend on all the acquisitions. Um, yep. But we we definitely um, should get the whole the whole span of the entire story. So maybe let's do this, Adam. Well, you just mentioned your partner. We need to hear that. Yep. So let's talk about yep. your partnership, uh, and then let's kind of quickly go through <laughs> the, the last yeah. ten years, and then we'll get into yeah. some more themes. Your partner. Great. Yeah, I'm running in my neighborhood that we were we were renting this little house in our neighborhood, and I'm running in it and. I look over and I see a familiar face who was a year ahead of me at Dart. I hadn't talked to him in five, six years, and it was a guy named Rick Ramsey. And I, you know, I, hey, Rick, why are you in Greensboro? You know, and he was working for a Danaher Health company at that point. And he he said, "What are you doing?" And I started telling him, and he was like, "That's really interesting. I would love to hear more." And we went through, and and that was about six weeks into the search, and I had realized pretty quickly. I, I need social, I need someone in the boat with me. And I wasn't sure what that was going to look like, but it was, you know, whatever, you know, higher power, whatever, put Rick in that spot. I was like, oh my gosh, like this is, and I think he felt the same way. You know, Rick always jokes that Rick's a little bit of the yin to my yang and that if he uh, had never met me, he, he probably never makes the jump. Mm. And if I hadn't met him, I probably would be bankrupt because I would have done tried to do too many deals. <laughs> and so we we kind of offset each other in, in a really really cool way. He's a very different. Uh, we we have similar backgrounds from the standpoint of we both went to UVA, but he's an investment. He was a former investment banker, uh, worked in operations, um, so had a pretty different background than I did uh, from that standpoint. And uh, and it's just he, he you know he and I will go to a meeting and we'll write down ten questions you know, coming out of that meeting and there'll be 10 different, they'll, they'll all be different. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, and, and that was one of the things that was hard was early on. It was like, okay, well, how are we going to uh, be partners? How are you going to divide it? And I had taken the chance he hadn't. And, and we worked out a way in the deal fee in the initial deal that I got a greater proportion, but you know, he was pretty adamant and I'm thankful he was, that once we did the deal, everything was 50-50. And, and I mean, everything we do is 50-50. And I think that has really simplified our partnership uh, in, in, in creating just pure alignment of, you know, you know, no one ever has a little bit more than the other. And, um, and I think for us, that was, 
that was a really smart thing we did early on that has has built a really strong foundation to to our partnership. I know, but, I'm, but I'm, I think I missed it. You had a little bit more of the first deal and then 50-50 after. Can, uh, say it again, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so we we had to somehow account for the fact that I was searching. I had to get paid for, you know, I, I, like once we had a deal fee, I had to get some benefit for that. So I did. So I got, now, was it commensurate to what I would have made you know, for a full year salary, absolutely not. It wasn't close, but I got a, a bigger chunk of that. But then we made the agreement once the deal started. Once he mm-hmm. quit his job, we were fifty fifty on everything moving forward. Um, and that so you got like a flat fee kind of co- one time compensation, exactly. ca- cash amount for the labor your labor and time finding the deal, but going forward in ownership fifty fifty equity split. Yep, that's exactly right. And, and essentially the way we did it was we did it so that I didn't really need to put any money in the first deal, right? So my deal fee mm-hmm. kind of rolled in and, uh, mm-hmm. and he did. And so that was, that was what we did. And, um, you know, partnerships are like marriages. They're very similar. Um, uh, you know, it, it, you know, we, it's something you have to work on. It's something you have to spend time on. Um, but, you know, for us, a lot of, I think the secret sauce of our partnership is built around honesty, being very direct with each other, um, you know, stating when we you know want something. But most importantly, I think being very deferential to the other person. Um, we have a, a term that I think we've stolen. I think Amazon uses this called disagree and proceed. Um, and mm-hmm. and we will we disagree uh, uh, more often than not, actually, on on how to approach certain things. But once we proceed, we never question it. Um, we've done some side investments and done some stuff. I mean, there's been even deals, one of the four deals we did, uh, where he was really pushing for it. I wasn't as excited about it, but we did it. And there were times in the first couple of years where you're like, you know, in my mind, it starts to creep in. Gosh, we shouldn't have maybe done this, but I would never dare. It's like, no, no, no. I agreed to do this. I agreed to do this. And it's disagree and proceed. So you just proceed. And, and we're very careful about doing that with our leadership and with our employees and making sure that they always see a, a very united front from the two of us. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of like, you know, kind of like a, it, a, you know, a parents, you know, you want to have a good united yeah. front with your kids. Yeah. Yeah. And when you, I, I don't, I, the f- framework is familiar to me, but I don't know it um, super well. When you disagree, how, what is the tiebreaker? to then proceed yeah, it, how do you decide it, 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 yeah. it, it, it's it's i don't i'm not sure we have a good process for it it's ultimately who is more who is more who cares, who cares more, more. <laughs> and, mo- and yeah. most of, and we've never you know when i say disagree i mean we've never had big disagreements there are always small disagreements about maybe how who to hire or um how to proceed with a sales strategy or something like this and 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 it's never been big um, but it's very important we have that process to flush out our differences so that when we are then sharing it with our organizations, uh, we come across as uh, united front. And we are. You know, like I don't I don't I don't want ever that ever come across as disingenuous. It's not. Like once I once I agree to something that maybe I didn't agree with at first, I'm all in. Um and uh mm-hmm. and, and Rick's definitely been the same way. I uh in in a previous partnership had this form of communicating with my partner where we would say, if we're disagreeing, we, we learn to quickly in the disagreement say one to the other, are you strong? How strong are you in this? Are you strong? <laughs> and because what we found yeah. is like you could argue about something and then realize that you're just arguing because you're having this kind of intellectual debate and then realize that actually one person doesn't actually care that much about the outcome to begin with. Yeah. So it was sort of an accelerant. It's like, wait, 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 are you strong on this? Because I'm not. I think you're wrong, but I'm not that strong on it. So if right. you want it, you can have it if oh, you're really yeah. strong on it. And the other partner says, yeah, I'm strong on this. You say, fine, you know, and, but, but you use it sparingly. Yeah, like you don't, you know, you don't, neither person, neither yeah. party abuses, you know, everything can't be strong all the time, of course. Um, so it's, but it worked. It was, it was. A, well, we, we, we use a, we use a term. We say we violently agree <laughs> with each other sometimes, yeah. you know, like, like we're violently agree, like we're arguing and then it's like, wait. I think we're I think we're actually agreeing with each other and we, we you know we, you know and that's always how it kind of kind of spawns out. Cool. So you guys agree to a partnership um and uh and I and and so I guess it was 
he'll quit his job when you find the deal and that yep mm -hmm. that's right so uh, uh we literally the, the the we we had the meeting that morning with the new business he leaves he goes and gives us two week notice um as we you know as we uh on the day we closed essentially mm -hmm. and how close were you when you jogged past his house and found him and started talking partnership how close were you to finding a deal uh at that point not close at all because it was only we were only i'd only been searching for six six seven weeks at that point oh wow um, so you had a full so, year ahead of you yeah almost. so it was a year it was a year of search ahead of us um and, and and i think we officially agreed to partner probably three months after that initial meeting uh it's kind of a you know weird almost pseudo like dating process because you're kind of like wait do sure. i i really got to get to know this person and and, and vice versa mm -hmm. uh before we agree to do something together and 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 while you were searching and having these countless meetings um that you had you'd already realized that you wanted somebody else in the boat with you um he was a sounding board and and you'd come home or talk on the weekends you had regular meetings i assume where you're debriefing him on all these meetings and stuff, and he's just kind of being a sounding board and providing advice where he can, but he's not really putting in any man hours, as it were, or any. He, he, yeah, sweat. he's he's probably he's probably putting in you know five to ten hours a week on kind okay. of just talking through things, and okay. he would occasionally come to a meeting if it was we deemed it was really important for him to be there. Um, but we didn't feel like you know we see sometimes I see sometimes where we have searchers where there's two partners and they're both searching. Um, but we felt like for a geographically constrained search, that didn't make sense. We we only needed needed one of us to to you know be searching full time. Okay. Okay, Adam. Well, let's uh, <laughs> let's hear about your first deal. Maybe a little bit more detail yeah. on that one, and then let's but let's hear about all four of them. Uh, abbreviated version. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the worst day of of the entire search for me was. Uh, uh, it was on my 33rd birthday and a deal that we were looking at had fallen apart. Uh, we had spent so much time on it. This was, uh, I'd been looking at this point for eight or nine months and coming out of that, the person who had connected us to that deal introduced us to our, our first deal. Um, and so, you know, from, from, from the rubble of what I deemed to be the kind of worst moment of, of that year. Um, and it was a structural steel business and we originally looked at it. Um, I didn't, it, I, I didn't necessarily like instantly go, Oh, this is it. Um, uh, you know, there was, there was some to like about it. It's pretty capital intensive, um, in a, in construction, which is very cyclical. And, and remember in 13, 14, 08 and 09 was still very, very, much on people's minds. <laughs> um, that, you know, that was still a lot of owners would, would talk about it a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, but Rick actually called a, a friend of his who ran a, a similar type business in a different region. And that call kind of got us to convince them, okay, let's take a hard look at it. Um, so two, two founders, both in their late fifties. So this was, they were younger than most of the owners we had talked to. Um, who uh who were ready to move on and uh and so structural steel fabricator at that point we were um you know they, they were probably 28 you know, 27 28 employees uh top line maybe you know call it 12 million um but uh but a great little business um and uh and a great jumping off point for us so uh closed it uh in november of 14 so it was november 1st of 2014 and uh, have 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 been there ever since, and it's been a it, it, it's it's truly been a, a great ride with that one. It was twelve million when you bought it. What does revenue look like today? Uh, we'll probably do. Uh, I think we'll do thirty five this year. Great. And what would you say to people, Adam, who um, are scared off by? This construction businesses for precisely the reasons you just gave: cyclical, yeah. non-recurring, project-based, capex, <laughs> high, heavy capex. They're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, th 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 those factors are there. So, um, I, I think I think the, the the factors are the cyclicality and and the capex nature of it. It is tough. That being said, I think there's ways that in construction you can differentiate yourself from from other 
uh, other trades uh, through, you know, building strong relationships, um, you, know, you know, through, I, you, to me, one of the reasons I'm, I've am i frankly am drawn in some ways towards construction is because it's because of the blue collar nature of it, because you're, you're building things. It, it, it It's pretty neat. I mean, like, like going to a job site where we've got a bunch of steel going up and you see the kind of exoskeleton of the building, that's neat. Uh, yeah. You know, it's just, it's neat to be able to go look at. Yeah. Um, that's cool. And, and I will tell you this, uh, you know, 2008, 9, and 10 was really bad for that industry because, you know, something like 30% of the workforce left and then they never came back. So as you think about searching, that has created a void. If you think about the people who were 25 to 40, you know, 15 years ago, who are now kind of in the more senior positions, there's a, there's a real dearth of talent there. And, and so I really feel like that's a place where you can lean in and differentiate yourself. Uh, if you, you know, add a level of kind of professionalism, uh, hmm. and, and level of customer service that, that, uh, that is there. And, and, you know, you know, listen, no one, you know, there's not many kids who, who, who grew up wanting to be in steel fabrication. Um, but it's a really cool business because <laughs> you get to make st- it's 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 Lego blocks. It's making the right size Lego blocks and then putting them together. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I did that as a kid. That's pretty cool. And mm-hmm. uh, and so for me, it's a it's it's a pretty nice fit. That's well put. I mean that that that, is, that does sound really cool. When you talk about the kind of the um, labor void, uh, the reverse bulge from people who who left the industry 15 years ago in 08. You know, I maybe like prior to COVID and prior to this labor shortage, I would have said, yeah, that sounds great. But now I'm just so I just the challenges with hiring people are so acute mm-hmm. across so many industries, particularly blue collar, that it does not appeal to me to hear about an industry where, you know, there's there's this kind of systemic underemployment, like under um, lacking labor pool. Yeah, because. Yeah. Yeah, if I'm going to be the manager, I'm like, okay, yeah, great. I can differentiate myself because there's not going to be a lot of me. But then you grow the business and you're going to need, going to, need to have managers. You're going to need to have talent who run the business under you or as you go by your other acquisition. And it's just then you're stuck with the same problem all over again. How are you going to find those people? Yeah, um, I think I think where – and I totally think what you're saying is is valid. I think where we've been able to differentiate is is, one, how we treat people. Um, you know, we, we are, we truly care. I mean, you know, I can say it and and it can come across as a lot. Every business owner says that. Um, but I think our actions over the last nine years have spoken to the fact that we, we truly try to take, take care of our folks. Um, and you know, I, I, you know, I'd say, well, there's, there's other managers and there's other companies that maybe aren't quite as professionalized as you are. They're not, you know, to me, that's what you're competing against. You're, the, the blue collar workforce, you can figure out that puzzle if you're applying kind of good principles to it, and if you, I think, are truly genuine with your current employee base. And so, for us, we've been able to have, particularly coming out of COVID, a very high level of retention with our employees. And put, listen, part of it is you, you pay, right? Pay matters. Um, you provide good benefits, and and that's where the you know, kind of having the bigger entity has helped us some, um, and uh, and and you try to attract younger talent, um, and, and I think that's the part. I mean, we, we live in an area, Central North Carolina, from a construction standpoint, and from a, a, is exploding. I mean, we had a hundred thousand people move to North Carolina last year, so we've got a lot of people coming in. There's a lot of opportunity too, um, but. I, I just I don't think as a manager you can I don't think there's any space that's um, not struggling with labor right now mm. and so I think if it, you know as a searcher if you're afraid of labor then you probably shouldn't get by a small business <laughs> because mm-hmm. labor is going to be there everywhere mm-hmm. labor problems are going to be there I mean I talk to you know law firms accounting firms they're having horrible issues with labor mm. um, so I don't think it's it's necessarily unique to construction. Okay, so that was November 14. You buy the first business, Steel Fabricator. What's the yep. business called? Uh, engineered Steel Products. Engineered Steel Products. Okay, take us to your next uh, your next acquisition. The day we submitted the IOI for ESP, 
uh, engineered steel, we submitted a second IOI for a business called American Industrial. And they that process was just slower. And so we ended up with ESP. AIC ended up coming back to us and saying, hey, we're interested. And we said, we're not ready. Can we reapproach? And so about a year later, we started the conversation and then uh, ended up buying a, a business called American Industrial, which is an uh, HVAC uh, industrial and commercial contractor here in Greensboro. Um, you know, similar, uh, you know, call it, uh, at that point, they were probably a $10, $12 million business, 60 employees, um, kind of similar size to ESP, but, but most importantly, similar customers. And, you know, as we look at the, if we list off the risk of when you buy a business, number one is always customer defection and customer relationships. Well, we had the steel business where we had these relationships with customers that we could translate over to this HVAC business. We did not intend to be into uh, to you know, uh, construction trades. That wasn't what we set out to do. But when we looked at the deal risk and we looked at the kind of deal profile, it just made sense uh, for us. And, and, and so we bought that in January of 2017. Just to be clear, so the customer base here um, is developers. Your your general general contractors general, general contractors, contractors who would have been hired GCs, by the developer, yeah. and That's so right. the GCs and so the GCs hire you to provide and put up the the steel, um, yep. and then they they would also be the decision maker on the HVAC system that's going to go Correct. into this new building. Okay, that's right. and so obviously same decision maker if you can sell them twice <laughs> for your two different companies. Now I, I I like to always ask this when. I hear a guest talk about a perceived synergy. Um, none of us, you know, that, that old cliche word, a lot of ways to put it. But uh, um, you, have to, you have to do it like this. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah, linking, yeah, linking. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Um, because I just feel like sometimes those can, you know, sound good on paper, but they just, for whatever reason, they just don't. Uh, they just don't work. Like the, the GCs already have their HVAC relationships. And just because they work with you on steel doesn't mean they're going to dump all their current HVAC relationships for you sort of for, as as just one hypothetical. So, yeah. but did it work? Is it working? How do, how do you respond? Uh, it's a great point. We thought it was, we thought it was going to be so symbiotic and like work so well. Symbiotic. There's another one. <laughs> yeah. Um, not really. It, it, like it was, it, it was, it was the same decision maker was making the steel decision versus the HVAC decision, but an HVAC decision is very, very different than a steel. It's just a different decision. Now, did it help that Rick and I developed relationships with owners of the GCs and we could talk to them about both? Yes. Um, it's funny. We're six years in on this and we're still kind of trying to figure out how to make it work. Um, it works sometimes. Um, I tell you when it did work, it worked during COVID um, when we had, we would have one business that would be really slow and we would, to be able to retain as many people as we could, we moved people over to the other business because some of the skill sets were somewhat transferable, not perfectly transferable, but they would help. Um, but it didn't work as well as we thought. You know, I think on paper we were like, oh, we, we have these customers and we'll just go to them and sell them HVAC. To your point, well, they had an HVAC guy. They don't. They don't want that from us. They don't want that from their steel provider. Um, through time, we've been able to do that, and I think in another few years that'll even be even better. But that does it takes it takes a lot of time, and so uh, you know it's it's interesting. And, and we're just now really exploring the idea of the shared services with it between particularly those two businesses because they are both in construction, but it takes time. And, uh, and we were kind of getting there and then, you know, COVID happened and we had hit everything on pause for a couple of years, but, uh, but, you know, ask me in another, you know, five years and I'll maybe have a, a maybe, I'll, maybe it'll be a better answer and I'll say, oh yeah, it worked great. It just took a decade um, mm -hmm. uh, of, of getting it to work. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you might agree with me that maybe synergies, there's somebody considering a second acquisition, maybe don't over, uh, state to yourself what you know what the what the potential is there be super conservative yeah, on it take, on it, take whatever potential you think is then divide it by like you know 10 i mean <laughs> like it, it's it's it i think the thing is it, it can be there 
just don't underestimate the amount of time it's going to take to truly be able to get the value from it. Yeah. It was a 10 to $12 million business. And today, what does top line look like? Uh, we'll probably do 15 to 17 this year, somewhere in that neighborhood. Okay. So we've had some growth, not nothing crazy. Uh, Adam, uh, I'm still very aware of time, but I just wanted to circle back. I didn't ask you how you were financing. What, what, what did your financing look like on your first deal and then subsequently? Yeah, so we had uh, we had three minority investors who invested, uh, and they did, um, and then Rick and I, you know, obviously invested, and then we uh, got traditional senior lender, just a traditional senior note. Um, we were Rick and I were unlimited guarantors on that debt, and then our investors, and this is unique, our investors were pro rata guarantors on that debt as well. Um, as a as someone who's since invested in uh, search deals, I recognize like I would never have done that. Uh, fortunately, they were real big believers in ours, which which we're very grateful to them. Um, but we we just had traditional senior debt. Uh, got very comfortable with uh, signing personal guarantees. Um, but at that point, you know, particularly in thirteen, you know, signing or fourteen signing a personal guarantee, I was like, great, like. I don't have a lot, so yeah. you could have it. Um, it. It didn't. I'm not sure it meant a lot, um, but um, but that's how that's how we have financed uh, virtually every deal in some kind of way or flavor. We also, I should be, it should be clear, um, uh, the first two deals uh, each had seller notes on them. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and we had earnouts on them on the first two as well. Um, and so that was, you know, that earnout is just such a great way to bridge the gap. You know, every time we would talk to an owner, they would say, "Yeah, yeah, I know what I've done, but this year it's going to go like this," you know. And we would just say, "Fine, we'll give you all that upside, um, but we can't, you know, we'll give it to you through some sort of uh, version of an earnout." And so, so we really thought about it in four tranches: earnout, seller note, bank note, equity, and those were kind of the four tranches we would use. Uh, to, to get and and why didn't you do an SBA loan at least in, in that first deal? Uh, not flex. It, 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 SBA just because has, of the earnout, it won't let you do an earnout. Exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. And so we started going down that path, and and we quickly realized that we we felt like the earnout was a really great tool to bridge gaps between valuation expectations. And with SBA, you know, they're, they're very. I think you might be able to in some cases, but for the most part, you can't. You can't do it or not. Yeah, one of the things people like about SBA loans is how much leverage you can you can use. Yeah. So, did you have a less generous leverage situation in your first deal? No, we were pretty levered. Um, oh. Yeah, partly because a lot of the deals we're doing, we're not we're not buying deals at at six to eight times EBITDA. Um, we're buying deals that um, are, you know, are lower. It costs value-based buyers of three to four times EBITDA, and so when you're at those lower numbers, you can get as a percentage of the deal, you can get a lot more leverage on them because the banks are going to get way more comfortable with that, you know, as opposed to having to come up with, you know, a, a five, six, seven, eight times EBITDA business. Yeah. You're going to have to have equity, a lot, a lot more equity in those types. Yeah. Great. Uh- your next acquisition, Jet Hot. Uh, a guy, uh, a guy who used to work for Rick in investment banking, called us about it. We had actually heard about Jet Hot for years, knew it was there. They originally wanted to sell the building with the business. We didn't want the building, so we weren't interested. And then we reapproached. We thought Jet Hot was a great way to not be uh, in construction uh, and and kind of diversify a little bit. Jet Hot is. Um, uh, we coat automotive parts for uh, anywhere where there's heat or corrosion in an engine. We coat that part. Um, and it's really got two sides. One's the commercial side. So we do that for kind of commercial engines. And then, uh, you know, if you're a tinker or have a hot rod or something like that and you want to do any sort of coating on, on any sort of uh, parts on your, uh, on your, you know, your, your car, uh, you'll send it in to us and we, and we do that as well. So is it kind of a, Oh, so you guys actually do the the treatment of the of the engines? We correct. So we have think imagine we have a bunch of uh, ovens and we have the engine parts, not the engines, but the engine parts, yeah. kind of rolling through a line um, and and you know heating on that essentially that uh, uh, that, that, that that coating that you're putting on the the different parts. And the coating is also your proprietary product, or correct? Yeah, mm-hmm. that's right. That's right. That's right. 
And is it kind of a single single skew business where you have the coding and the process and that's it? No, there's the, there's there's several different coatings, uh, particularly on the on the consumer side. You know, there's different colors. Uh, mm. People like doing different colors for you know uh, their their different types of parts. Um, so there's a fair amount of different coatings, but primarily we do. Uh, there's primarily two two types of coatings that we do that that make up the, the predominant amount of our business. Um, you know, it's it's a nice little business. It 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 you know it can be very de- it is very dependent on the automotive supply chain. So as you can imagine, 2020 and 21 were very rough on that business just from the standpoint of we just couldn't get parts. Yeah. Um, but uh, but for the most part, that's been that's been a really good deal for us. We've 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 really enjoyed both the people there, the customers there, and uh, and you know it's uh, uh, it's it's been you know it's performed well, which has been which has been nice. And and in the world of hot rodding, is this like a brand that everybody knows? Yeah, which is super fun because. You know, when I say to you, engineered steel or American industrial, you know, no one knows that other than a few folks locally. But when you say jet hot, you say jet hot to the right person and they go, <laughs> oh, jet hot. Yes. You know, <laughs> like, so cool. and, it, and what was really fun is we had employees from our first two businesses who, when they heard about that, were so excited. I mean, we had guys who had jet hot uh, bumper stickers on their cars because they really bought into this. And, uh, and so they were so excited about that, and so it is. It is a brand that is known among certain circles. Certainly, yeah, yeah, yeah that's fun. That's super fun. How big was it then, and how big is it today? Uh, top line, top line, six million. It's still six million. Uh, you know, we kind of started to have a little growth, and COVID chopped that pretty hard, and now we've kind of gotten back to to pre to to, to previous uh, previous levels. So, uh, relatively small top line, but. But actually, I mean, we have probably 40, 45 employees. That, that business is a little different in that we don't take on inventory. So uh, there's, you're really getting, it's really a service based business. Mm. Um, and so, you know, even though your you know, revenue is a little lower, um, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's from an employee standpoint, you know, somewhat a little bit smaller than the other two businesses, but still has, has a good amount of folks. Mm-hmm. And what year was that? Did you say that you acquired Jet High? That was uh, that was the beginning of 2019. Okay, so at this point, 2019, with this Jet Hot acquisition, are you are you seeing yourself as a hold co yet? Yeah, I, I I think in late 19 that started to really start to form, and and like Jet Hot at the time had a had a full time IT uh, person, but it was a you know small business, and so it's like they didn't need a full time IT person. So we elevated him to be over all our businesses, and he was kind of the first person that I was like, "Oh, this shared service model could really be pretty powerful." Um, and so in early twenty, we really started to outline what we were going to do. Um, and then March of twenty twenty hit, and mm. all that got put on pause for really about eighteen months, um, as we just had to kind of hold on and and hunker down for for what was a a, a very bumpy ride uh, across all three in, in very different ways so and then covid calms down and yep. so you you i i guess you reintroduce that conversation amongst yourselves yeah and, so, and, and, tr- so. and interesting just to call out adam it sounds like the shared services um, insight was really what led you to start thinking Oh, we're a hold co, or oh, we should think about ourselves as a hold co. Yeah, it, 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 we had benefit from that that um, that one employee that I mentioned. The other thing that happened was Rick and I started recognizing that if we were going to do more than three, we had to elevate up because you know a lot of this. Like I was, I was wearing a lot of different hats, and so was he. And we, we, and, and, and through COVID, we had to kind of really hone in on those. And, and, but as we got out of that, we were like, wait a second. And we made a, we made a pretty bold hire, uh, about, uh, in middle of 21. He was actually the city manager for, uh, the city of Greensboro. So city of Greensboro has 3,200 employees and he has been a friend. He's, he's, you know, around our age and he was a city manager. And so I'm sitting there going, and we were talking, and, and I said, I said, hey, David, if you ever think about leaving, I knew he wanted to stay locally. We should talk. And 
and we brought on it was a very outside the box hire um it has transformed our organization because he has been able to be the primary operator in now two businesses while rick and i can elevate up and look for more deals and you know i think it we've always been a big believer in hiring athletes not always hiring experts because most of these businesses have experts they have great experts in them but I love someone who's just a good athlete who can kind of do a bunch of different things. And that's what David was. David's the best. He's the best people manager I've ever seen. And, um, and so it's, it's, it's pretty humbling when you see someone take a business that you've been trying to run and then run it a lot better than you did. And, <laughs> and I'm like, great, this is awesome. You know, this, this is, this is fun. And it's fun for me personally because I'm, I'm, I'm close with him and, and to see him kind of have a lot of fun with this. And so through that hire, then, you know, then we realized we needed a safety officer, you know, and, and, and each of these businesses couldn't afford a full-time safety person, but combined they could. Um, and, uh, and now we've promoted someone from within to be a finance uh, uh, officer or, or a director of finance for New Page. And we're really now at this moment where all of a sudden we're creating this new page team that's that's helping these businesses and um and it's been fun it's been fun not so much not you know not just from the standpoint of rick and i being able to wear a different hat or kind of pull up a little bit but also it's been really really fulfilling to see those individuals uh step up and step up in a really meaningful way and uh and and have fun with it i mean i think you know, if you have truly ambitious people in a 50, 60 employee business, part of the issue is their growth is can be limited because of the size of the business. But when I talk about our 220 person business, you know, there's more options for us to kind of move folks around. And, and we've really started to explore that in a, in a meaningful way. It, it, you know, it's it's uh, I'm kind of making the same point a second time that you arrived at becoming a Holdsco kind of out of pragmatism. I mean, you just, you needed these things and, and, you know, yeah. the whole coast structure started making more and more sense for all the reasons you've, you've just said. And it's just striking because on SMB Twitter and, and among my audience, having a hold co is kind of a fantasy. It's a hot trend, but I think it's more just because it seems cool and fun, yeah. you know, to, to yeah. kind of, yeah. to own a bunch of different businesses. Um, and, uh, and, you know, Warren Buffett is, widely admired and he's kind of like the holds coke king so everyone talks about having the mini berkshire hathaway um but you you arrived at it quite accidentally you kind of evolved into yeah. it um so just want to call that out um okay adam let's hear your most recent acquisition and then we still yeah. have a few more themes i i really want to make sure we get to yeah most recent acquisition was a business called wc rouse this was actually uh, is a boiler sales and service business that we, we we acquired that in September of 2022. Um, I had actually heard about this business 10 years ago before I'd even started searching. Um, and it was actually sold to a private equity firm out of Chicago. Then they had held it Their You know, their uh, uh, life of their fund, you know, it has a certain amount of time. So then they had to sell it. I had stayed in touch with them and they called me, in uh, April or May of last year and said, hey, would you still have interest in, in, in Rouse? And I said, I would. And so uh, we're, we were able to buy that. There's some benefit related to the HVAC business too, uh, some of which we're exploring, some of which we're, we're trying to figure out. But, um, but you know, that business allowed us to justify the safety officer. And, and that's what's been fun is each time we add a business, it allows us to kind of build more uh, around it. And um, and so that's been, you know, we're, we're six, seven months in now on that one. And it's been, uh, very good so far. And can you give us a sense of size of that one? Yeah. So that one's, uh, kind of 10 to 12 million as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe, maybe 12 to 14. As you keep playing and evolving and growing your shared services model, you know, at some point, Adam, you're also going to be confronted with the, the classic hold code debate of centralization versus decentralization. And you, and you guys are clearly moving toward centralized yeah. shared services um but um you know just yeah. raise your hand a little bit and you'll hear plenty of people telling you that you know you should be decentralized all the way um so have fun with that debate <laughs> it, it it's 
it's a fun de- it's a fun debate we we we've gone it's interesting because i've seen companies go centralized for you know spend five years going that way and then spend five years undoing it i imagine we'll probably have some sort of semblance of that but i do think it it's it's something we talk about a lot i think that's where our location helps though because if we centralize we're still here and and we can still be present i think sometimes when centralized models don't work it's when uh, you're pulling something to another state or to another region. Um, for us, we'll always have a presence. I still always have a presence, uh, you know, of, of visiting each business each week. And, and I think that's important. Well, one question on that, uh, Adam, now refla- reflecting back on your decision to kind of geographically search and be in a relatively small geography, um, you know, your 650 conversations 10 years ago, you've now acquired four businesses in the community. I assume people know you. I assume people now are trying to get your time rather than the other way around. Um, yeah. Is the pool of potential opportunities for for Greensboro really bottomless? Like I just would imagine at some point you're gonna you're gonna tap out. And I mean you're, I mean, <laughs> no. you're gonna you're gonna need yeah. you're gonna need a no, wider pool. No, it's efficient. It, this is this is a conversation we're in the midst of right now. Um, because I do think at a certain point, like if you look at the triad, we think that we thought when we started there were probably six or seven hundred businesses that would fit somewhat in our parameters. I, I haven't. I, we haven't looked at all of them. We've looked at a lot of them, and and so we are starting to our pool starting to get a little more limited. But that being said, there were businesses that I talked to seven years ago where the owner was fifty four. And it was like, oh, this is not interesting. But now that owner is yeah. 61. Yeah. Maybe it is. And and so we do see some potential, you know, because that's the trickiest part about this is the timing has to be right, you know. And I think the timing is the hardest part because you have to catch that owner at the point when they're ready to, to pull the trigger. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so it's not a bottomless pit, but um, but I do think there's still – there's still some opportunities there. And I, and I think for us, uh, those opportunities could look like bolting on to our existing businesses, right? Um, and, and, and buying something that is related to something that, that we currently own. Yeah. Well, um, I don't know what your big life plan is, but you're about my age, about 40 years old. So you still have a couple decades in you, I would imagine. Yeah. So so at some point, maybe maybe not in the next year or two, at some point you're probably going to step outside this geography and maybe maybe you'll just cross that bridge when you get to it but i can't imagine at the rate you're going that greensboro is gonna gonna be provide the big enough pool for the next 20 30 years yeah it's 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 something that's tricky for us because we've been tempted uh we've looked at deals we've looked at several deals yeah we definitely definitely mm-hmm. particularly we particularly been tempted in uh businesses that we are already in and buying a competitor in a different region um, but you know, I think, I think we'll hesitate because it, it, COVID taught us the power of us being able to drive to the business every single day. Mm. And so every day I would, I would do the loop and it, it's, you know, I'd just go to each business and I would show up and I would be present. And I think that matters. Um, I think it, it matters for ownership to be present and, and to, to know the employees. Um, but you're right. I mean, the temptation is growing. Yeah. Um, yep. in terms of us going out of this market. And we've got, listen, we've got two massive, uh, we have two of the, the of the 10 fastest growing cities in the country in Raleigh and Charlotte that are an hour and an hour and a half down the road. There's a lot of opportunities there. And so at some point, I imagine we'll get pulled into doing something like that. Yeah. One of the things that we talked about in our pre-call was that you're more focused on stability than on top line growth. And, you know, it's funny as I, as I reviewed my notes and prepared for this call, because I realized (laughs) that searchers generally want both. So, so in other words, they, you know, they want stability, but also opportunity for growth. It's kind of like, you know, not high risk, high reward. They want low risk, high reward and capitalism doesn't usually work that way. No, Um, So you're you're at least honest about it (laughs) as opposed to the rest of us (laughs) delusional searchers, uh, low risk, high reward. Anyway. Um, so you're f- more focused on stability than grow, 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 grow. Um, elaborate on that, please. Yeah, we, we, 
we just felt like for us to be the type of operators that we wanted to be, we were never going to be these folks that were going to shake things up, make big, bold changes. Um, because I, I think for us, you know, being an employee of a business that's bought is really scary. It is scary. And, and, and there's no bet, there's no other word for it. Um, and particularly when someone's coming in who, you know, 10, you know, eight, eight, nine years ago, I'm 33, 30, you know, 33 years old. And they're like, who is this kid? Does he doesn't know anything about steel? You know, I'm putting my trust in him. I'm putting my family's livelihood in this person's hands. And, um, and I think for us, we best, we just felt like, the right way to do this was to do it slowly and steady. And it helped that we were both in our early 30s and we felt like, listen, we've got a 30-year horizon, um, which is crazy to think that, you know, to think about that kind of time timeline. But it is. And, and, and we weren't, we also didn't have a fund. And I think that really helped us be patient um, with these businesses because we've made investments that in the short term or even in the medium term have made no sense for these businesses, but long term we, we believe will. Um, and I just, I'm not going to say it's an easier way to, to, it's an easier path. It's certainly less dangerous because I have seen other folks come in and make all these changes and immediate and shake, shake the kind of foundation of the business. And all of a sudden you've got two or three key, two or three key people walking out the door. Um, and so I think when you think about that relationship you have with those key employees, um, I mean, it's so cliche, but, but you need them more than they need you. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and you just can't forget that. Um, and so I think, I think sometimes I remember the first month we owned the steel business and I was so wanting to make changes. Like I just wanted to improve it. I wanted to make it better. And I made some missteps early on, um, just just like doing what? stuff that just wasn't this is a really simple one i wanted to clean the office up yeah okay that sounds that sounds like oh well of course that i mean why would that be controversial but we had all these drawings and i wanted to just get rid of them i was like guys we have all these electronically we don't need these i wanted to get rid of them i wanted to throw them out and i started doing it and it made people really upset because they were like what if we need those because i didn't do a good job explaining you know, my kind of my process and it was just visually, it was tough to tough for people to see. And it's, it, it, you know, I was talking to an employee who was there this morning who was reflecting on that. And he was like, y'all just wanted to, you know, kind of say you were the guys in charge. And I was like, yeah, I was like, we're a lot better at it now than we were. Like for instance, the most recent acquisition we've, we've done, we've, we've done virtually nothing. Six months in, we've just been, Hey, just keep it stable. And then I think after about a year, you've earned that ability to start making real improvements. Um, but I, you know, the worst thing you can do in the first me month, two months, three months as a searcher is come in and try to just make changes, even if they seem as simple as thro as cleaning up the office, because it 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 can rattle the employees in a way that's not very healthy. Um, when, when they're already and, emotionally vulnerable. Oh, oh, and particularly when they don't know about it. And, and and most of the time they don't. And so you walk in, I mean, I've done it four times now. You walk in on day one and you see the looks on their faces and it is a fear. I mean, without a doubt, many of them have had uh, a friend, a family member who was part of a buyout who lost their job after the buyout. I mean, that that's always going to be the story you hear, and so uh, for us, it's it's hey, I'm going to sit down with you, Will, and I'm going to find out about you, and I'm just going to listen, and I'm not going to say much, um, and that's that's a lot of what we do. We do we do a lot of listening in the first three to six months of of the acquisition. Mm -hmm. Well, that change, how much to change, when to change, what to change it's a it's a theme that we talk about uh, constantly on this podcast. Yeah. And, um, and it's just so delicate, you can't talk about it enough. Adam, another thing you told me on the pre-call was about and on this theme of I think I think of stability as opposed to to growth is just how you you touched on it already. You come to have you've come to really 
think about yours as a people business and really taking care yeah. of the people. And you already said, I'll also say every business says that, every CEO has to say that. Um, but I uh, felt it from you genuinely when we talked. So can you, can you, can you elaborate? Yeah, I, I think for me, you know, financial success is, of course, part of the goal of this, right? Um, but I, I actually, it, it really changed. Early on, that was, that was the focus. It, you know, the focus was on control, meaning controlling where I lived, meaning controlling my schedule, meaning controlling my own outcome, um, and meaning controlling my financial destiny. Um, but I think as I've gotten further and further along, I've come to realize that like the thing that keeps me up at night is not, it's not, Hey, am I going to be able to retire comfortably? Hey, am I going to be able to put food on the table for my kids? Am I going to be able to help my kids pay for college? It's, Hey, are my employees going to be able to do a lot of that? And that for me is is just is, has become – I'm not going to become, say becoming the sole driver, but it's become a huge driver of, um, of you know, what we're doing. And, and so from, from that standpoint, um, it's going to come across as like, oh, gosh, that's so great. He cares about his employees. It's a little selfish. Because it's just what I worry about. So that's what I care about. You know, like, mm. I'd love to sit here and tell you that, like, you know, oh, yeah, I'm just so, like, gosh, I, isn't it great that I care so much about these people? Well, it's, it's what keeps me up at night. It's what I worry about. And so that's what I spend time on. That's probably a little selfish, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's also, to me, it's when I start to think about what, what people – well, people who work for us ultimately say of us, I, they're, they're not all going to like you. Everyone who works for me doesn't like me. That That's that's okay. Um, but I hope they respect the decisions we make and and they understand the decisions we make and they uh, and they want to work there. Um, and that's what we just want to, you spend, you spend you, all your adult life working with these people. You know, you, you, you know, if you're an employee and you say, why am I working? Why am I spending all my time with these, these individuals? And then the hope is that maybe you know you can you can do something in a in a way that is meaningful that people look back on and they say, "Gosh, I'm so uh, grateful for the opportunities that that we got at a new page company." I think that that segues into something I, I definitely wanted to return to when you talked all the way back um, at the intermediate year you spent learning how to be an operator before you started new page or before you did your search and how motivating people who are differently motivated than shiny people. Um, yeah. they're, and, and they're not just motivated by money or traditional um, kind of uh, professional accolades, maybe. Um, they're motivated by different, just differently motivated, as you put it, which I really liked. And so can, w w how are such people motivated? What what are some of the, the levers? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, it's... You know, the, the, the shiny people don't, they don't truly worry about, hey, are my kids going to have a right. meal on the table? Right. Are that, you know, hey, are my kids going to graduate from high school? You know, like, are, are my kids going to have a chance to even go to college? Um, that's what, that's what our folks, that's what our folks are, are thinking about, right? Um, am I going to have a job? You know, it, you know, and, and that was so much of what we've worked on the last three years was, conveying transparency and conveying um you know, conveying to these individuals yes you're going to be okay we're going to take care of you um and so they're motivated by that and they're and they're motivated certainly motivated by money but more than that they're motivated by a trust in a employer who is going to take care of them over the duration of their working career if they if they choose and you know, we've got a, a one individual in particular, and I won't say what company it is because it, it might give away who he is, but he he started at the lowest level of this company. He's been with us for 32 years. So uh, been with the company a very, very long time. Uh, and, and this is a very kind of working trade. He'll, he'll probably retire when he's 63. He'll retire a millionaire. And 
That's amazing. And it's, it's a total testament to him. It's a testament to the prior ownership that invested in his 401k and gave him you know, a 401k match and gave him good benefits. And it's a testament to him that he wants to, you know, he, and he's, he's so excited about it. You know, this was one of those things I was looking at or, you know, I, I'm the 401k administrator for all the different plans. And I was looking at it and I kind of went to him. I was like, man, you've done a great job saving. And he was, he's so proud of mm-hmm. what he's been able to do using his hands to become wealthy. And, and so, um, it's awesome. You know, I think, I think for that, and I think the other thing I'd say that's a motivator for me is, you know, when you manage uh, a, a bank consultant, um, you're, 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 you're almost kind of guiding the intensity, guiding the motivation. But when you're managing some of these folks, you're also helping them manage the, 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 the broader world in some ways as well uh, around health care around financial stability. Um, so we do a lot of programs to try to help our employees with those those things. Um, you know, financial stability, financial wellness, what does that look like? How much should you be saving? How are you thinking about retirement? Um, or healthcare, hey, are you taking care of yourself? Like you're gonna run into health issues if you, you know, don't take care of your 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 body. And and you know, in a rough and tumble blue collar environment, when we first did it, uh, it was scoffed at. Uh, it was scoffed at as mumbo jumbo. But we've created a culture now where I think individuals may, they may not always be receptive to it, but at the very least, they understand it comes from a good place of genuinely wanting to help. And uh, and, and what is and the so, it? It's a program where you kind of outreach to everybody and and say, hey, have you? So we do we do like lunch and learns where it's like, hey, here's financial, you know, personal finance mm. 101. Mm. Because, it, it, you know, if you're a welder and you came out when you're 18 from high school and you just started welding, no one's taught you the kind of fundamentals of what's 401k? How am I supposed to think about that? Yeah. How much should I set aside for that? No one's taught you of, hey, how much can I afford in rent? How much can I afford? Can I afford to buy a house? Because that's actually one thing that like, you know, home ownership is such a great a way to create wealth if it's done appropriately. And a lot of our folks think, well, I can't afford to buy a house. But, oh, no, no, no. Actually, you can. You mm. can afford that. They just, you know, it, it opens their eyes to it. And so we try to do a lot of lunch programs, uh, you know, like a lunch and learn, essentially, with our folks. Uh, buy them lunch. You know, it's funny. what You, you buy you, you give someone a free lunch, they're always going to come, right? goes back to There's the that, uh, 600. That first lesson. <laughs> that first lesson, right? So we buy them lunch, and then we we try to get them, uh, you know, get them to understand some of these things. And and, and listen, it, it, again, it comes across as, oh, gosh, that's so nice. You do that for your employees. No, that that's so good for us because that makes them feel more connected to us as well. It shows that we're investing in them. It's a good business decision. I, I'm I'm doing it. It makes me personally feel good, but it's also the best business decision because I'm investing in those people. Yeah, yeah. The kind of double bottom line kind of kind that's of right concept. That's right. Um, Adam, to close out, so give us uh, just going back to to the numbers after after talking about some of the more qualitative stuff. Um, so you you don't. Your your own personal focus is less on EBITDA, EBITDA, EBITDA sort of thing, yeah. um, and you're willing because you are um, investing in these businesses for the long term. By the way, we should we should make that explicit. So you said thirty year horizon. So you're buying and holding. You know the phrase permanent equity. You we we hear a lot now. Um, you would put yourself in that category. Yes, definitely, definitely. Mm-hmm. We, you know, for us, we felt. Engineered steel. It's been nine years now, so mm-hmm. uh, it'll be nine years this year. So yeah, we we foresee the the uh, duration of our careers uh, owning these businesses. And so you know, squeezing a percent or two or three or five even uh, of EBITDA at each of these businesses means is less important when you're not trying to compute some multiple to then go sell it. And you can you Correct. can take that money and invest in your people. That's great. Um, but what tell us <laughs> what the aggregate top line number is of the portfolio today? So we have a sense of scale. We I've been kind of counting as I go, but yeah, I trust your number more than mine. We'll do. We'll do. We'll probably be around seventy five million top line this year. 
uh, about 200 and we probably have 220 employees uh, as of right now. That's great. And I, I uh, think, it's, think it's fair to say in 2013, you were not, your ambitions were, were not that lofty. And and yeah and yeah they, here you are only forty or forty ish yeah they, they, long they, way to they, go. they no they definitely weren't you know it's I, when I when I would go through it and everyone would ask well how many businesses do you want to buy and when I had none I would say I just want to buy one <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just want one yeah. and then when we had one and I started looking again well how many we how many are you doing and I was like I just want two and I think for us we have just methodically just you know and I listen I'm starting to look again I'm starting to search again. Um, and so people, well, how many do you want? I was like, I just, I'm just worried about getting number five. I'm not worried about the bigger picture. And I think that's, that's been good for us because I think it, it, you know, if you keep your head down, you keep doing the hard work, you look up and all of a sudden it's like, wow, this is, this is pretty cool. What we've been able to, yeah. uh, to achieve. Yeah, it sure is. Adam, what is your preferred way, uh, that people would reach out to you? Do you like email? Do you like LinkedIn? Do you? I would say email, um, and I, I'm happy to share that right now, or, or I don't know. The, you give it to me, and I'll just put it in the show notes. Or you okay, can say it, or it, you can say it. Go ahead. I'll say it. It's a Duggins at, at newpagecapital.com. So, uh, and I, email's great, and I, I, will never not, I will never say no to a conversation. I, you know, I mean, I, if Be for careful, me, Adam. You got I a know, lot of people I'm, I'm who are really going to admire you no, from this no. interview. I, well, <laughs> I, I, to me, out. to me, it's it's. I had so many people help me, so many, and so uh, I, I, I get I get more I get more from those conversations than anyone who's like calling me and say, "Hey, you know, how do how do I do this? How do I do that?" I get off those calls and I'm energized because um, because it's fun to help. It's fun to help other folks kind of achieve uh, you know what they want to achieve. Great. Beautiful point to end on. Adam Duggins, congratulations on what you've built. Can't wait to keep watching you. Uh, and thank you very much for giving me so much of your time. Will, this was awesome. I really appreciate it. I appreciate what you're doing and uh, appreciate uh, you having me on. I hope you enjoyed that interview. Make sure you subscribe to the Acquiring Minds channel below. We are now publishing twice a week. So tons of new interviews and stories to come. Stories that will help you along your own path to acquiring a business.